Hi all. I thought because of the importance of the first World Championship match between Steinitz and Zuckertort in 1886 that um, I'd show you another game, but also at the same time uh, maybe broadly discuss how Steinitz you know, played a significant role in the end of the Romantic era. Um, against Zuckertort he kicked off with e4 and after e5 he didn't play f4 which is what he used to play like 10 years before. He played actually knight f3, and this game, you know, shows basically the accumulation of small advantages at work. Now, I'd like to say a few broad things here that really he's beating off a, a major combinatory player. Zakatort was was well known as a tactical combinatory player, so Steinitz, you know, had basically determined even more preconditions than Morphy for what makes a successful combination. Morphy in his games had demonstrated some awareness of basic elements such as advantages in space and time and you know especially a lead development from the opening, grip on the centre. And you know he was beating people combinationally and sometimes uh, saving himself against the combinational players because he had that awareness, the X factors. And it's as if Steinitz was building on those X factors of the position to create more, you know, ideas like weak pawns could could be a fatal weakness. And in this game, actually, Black did have a weak pawn later on c6, which led to his collapse, as we'll see. So these other X factors which Steinitz introduced um, meant that Steinitz was bringing to the world, um, you know, the roots of positional play and the accumulation theory. There were two basic premises, in fact, which um, Sultis in Encyclopedia Britannica sums up Steinitz as bringing. The first, as, as we saw demonstrated in another video, uh, was the, the idea that the position is at first at balance. There's an inherent balance between the forces. And the second is that checkmate is the ultimate, but not the first objective of the game. So the, the Steinitz shift to knight f3 and, you know, without the king's gambit stuff is less risky, and he had lost actually one game to his student Zakatort, you know, ten years before this game. So here he's playing in a much more calm, sort of modern way, just building up advantage a bit more slowly and surely. And in fact, after knight f6, he plays the seemingly very quiet d3 move here. So really, was it Steinitz alone, though, through just beating off the combinatory player and declaring himself world champion? Um, was that enough for the end of the Romantic era, the end of the, the, the massive use of the King's Cabinet? I think it was more than that. Because Steinitz had, had been heavily involved in the first British chess magazine, and he's setting himself up with maximum credibility of being the first official world champion, and generally, I think communication resources, the printing press generally was taking off. It was a time when science could step in to start to explain things in all sorts of disciplines and, and other intellectual pursuits like chess. So it was in that era. I, and with respect to era, Kasparov, in his great predecessor series, had attributed quite a lot to the contextual you know, age of the various you know, major world champions. In fact, I quote, he says that uh, the best masters of each epoch have been closely linked with the values of the society in which they lived and worked. So all the changes of a cultural, political and psychological background are reflected in the style and ideas of their play. And, you know, Kasparov indicates that this deep connection can be traced back a long time. And um, in the particular case of Steinitz, basically the era which, you know, Kasparov attributes to Steinitz is, is basically you know, between 1886 and 94 Steinitz effectively dominated chess from the early 70s, an ardent follower of the scientific method which could, in his opinion, provide the key to solving many of the problems arising on the chessboard so he was the first to divide the position into its component elements to pick out the most important factors and to state the general principles of strategy so this was a great discovery, a turning point in chess history uh, Kasparov goes on to say though that uh, you know, that perhaps Steinitz overestimated the importance of the theory of positional play he created and relied excessively on abstract uh, principles. So there, w there was room for improvement there. And you know, Steinitz's theories, you know, actually challenged by what I consider a dogmatist, Tarash, but actually Tarash, with the Tarash defence, 
is not so much a dogmatist to 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 the pawn structure, um, you know, emphasis of Steinitz, because the Tarish, by definition, is, is all about, uh, you know, get, gaining extra space in the centre and mobility and compensating for the isolated pawn. So there was still room uh, for innovations and, and challenges from Steinitz's theory. It was far from complete, but it was a basic framework, basically, for, um, you know, dividing position elements and the accumulation theory. So we'll see here, in this game, that Steinitz develops slowly in the centre, and another factor, by the way, from, from the world of chess, you know, why did Steinitz play combinatory 10 years before and, and he started to show, you know, he was a good positional player even 10 years before this match, is because a lot of the time he was actually being paid for, for brilliant games by, by people. So that obviously influenced his style, especially, you know, Places like the, the coffee house that, you know, the Café de la Régence, where they were playing blindfold simultaneouses. It was the whole atmosphere of the time was geared up for brilliance. Um, so there, there were various aspects to, to how Steinitz, um, you know, ended up accelerating the end of the Romantic era. But uh, beating off the combinatory, combinatory players like Zuckerstor is is obviously a very important aspect of that by providing his theories with greater, you know, credibility. Because uh, the evidence of, of beating other, other, other players is, in, ch in chess terms, you know, that, that is like a scientific proof. Because chess, you know, is just a game. Um, so here, you might be surprised, by the way, that is Steinitz breaking his own rules for attack. You know, this h4 move. It seems to be attacking. But the thing is, it's not quite purely about attacking the black king. In fact, it's more positional about binding black on the white squares, because after h5, g5, white has a clear positional advantage, because now f5s, um, well, it's prevented at the moment because of this bishop on d3, but potentially also this knight could come maybe to g3 to f5 later with an advantage. That's something to bear in mind. In fact, Steinitz already makes preparations for that with knight f1. Now he drops back his bishop, and so this this is really part of an accumulation of advantages already. This this h4 h5, it's not just a hack attack. So knight g3, this bishop d7 allows white to, to sneak in castle in queenside. However, the idea is is to reroute the bishop to attack a2. So rook d2 now bishop e6. So you would think that there's there's some potential for for counterplay on the queen side. Maybe because the rook's you know nicely supporting the pawn, it looks fairly dangerous. But um, Stein is concerned with just accumulating advantages, and he's not too scared about the attack. He plays actually knight f5, and Black now is in a bit of problems actually because if he did retreat the queen, so not giving up this light square bishop, then Ribka gives a nice advantage actually, just just in this position to play rook d1. So why would this actually be the case? Why couldn't like bishop takes a2 be played here? Well, in this position, apparently bishop takes a4, and white would stand better because really this knight is is doing the job successfully. This bishop's not very good, so if white has regained his pawn, then white must have an advantage here. Well, Ribka thinks so anyway. So uh, after knight f5, in fact, black. Black took on f5, and so he's damaged his potential for counterplay. He's giving up that important knight square bishop. And also, this pawn is kind of dangerous, potentially, as well. But it is double pawns. So Steinitz is aware of, like, the dynamics of, you know, he, he got that bishop, but uh, his, his structure is a little bit damaged. But um, it's not a big deal. This, this is a, a bit of a controversial move, I think, g4. Although it seems sensible and logical to play g4 to support this f5 pawn, it might not be strictly necessary. Maybe a quieter move like queen f2, just to try and get in on c5, might be a better idea to delay g4. But he plays it anyway, and it simplifies white's play, bishop e4. But one of the problems potentially is, is knight d5 to f4 as well, that this, this pawn can't be used to kick a knight on, on f4. So rook d8, now queen c2. Now knight d5. So Steinitz is not too concerned though. He allows the knight potentially to come to f4. Bishop f2. 
So if knight f4, let's have a quick look. If knight f4 here, well then this a pawn, it's a continual problem. Just queen takes a4 might be a good move there. So basically, bishop f2, b5 supporting the a pawn. But the c4 break, if, if this pawn is fixed, will, will mean that this structure is broken up. Here and here, these pawns will become isolated. And it's this, this forms the basis of Steinitz's next plan. So, you know, he's accumulated that advantage of the bishop here. And this bishop's slightly hemmed in. And now he's working on this structure for his next little plan. So no wonder they're all mystified by his play, because for his time in 1886, this is quite amazingly advanced positional play, splitting up black's pawns, and not you know minding the seemingly you know giving black the semi-open b-fold pressure. But it's harmless because black doesn't have the advantage really.